when I was a child here, it was not easy to get a seat in the sanctuary, either on Sunday morning or for special things. The worst time was trying to find a seat in the sanctuary on Christmas Eve. It was almost impossible. As an organist, I, there were things I loved about that. When I came here, the tradition had been that the organist would play a half hour recital before the Christmas Eve service because so many people had to come early to get a seat. So I was able to keep that tradition going for uh, quite a few years. It was fun for the organist. I was baptized in this church. I was married in this church. Our kids, I have five children, they were all baptized in this church. And at this point in my life, a lot of my good friends I met through the church. It's a church that over the years has been a very welcoming church, a very accepting church. One of the things that, that I uh, love about this congregation is their openness to all of God's people. And uh, we, we don't just accept, we celebrate every individual that comes through the, the doors of South Avenue United Methodist Church. And the congregation is very much open to the LBGTQI plus community. I cannot say who is welcome and who is not. Only God can do that. And God says all. And when God says all, it means all. The Methodists started in Wilkinsburg longer ago than any other congregation, with the exception of the Presbyterian Church that started up in, in what's now Churchill. They had originally built a, a Methodist church, the first church in the, in the entire, what was not a borough at that time, the village of Wilkinsburg. They were given land by James Kelly and built a, a one-room church, but they outgrew that very quickly, sold that one to the Baptists and built a church right here on this very site. Unfortunately, it was only there about 15 years massive fire and then they built again and at that time they knew they needed something much much larger and they ended up with this magnificent magnificent stone church it was a, an expandable church because over the years they have expanded it and added on in the 1920s they added on again in the 1960s a huge addition because those education was always an important part mission as well at one point there were over 3,000 people actually attending and that's because it was growing so fast that they also were the mother church to six additional churches. Some of them were in Wilkinsburg and some were just outside of Wilkinsburg. Well, I've been a part of South Avenue Church for 78 years, uh, starting at age three, but with a little 10-year defection uh, to other churches who needed organists at the time. In 1970, I came back to South Avenue to be the organist, the organist who had been my, the light of my life retired, and I was able to take her place. We have had a wealth of wonderful singers who have been willing to be part of the South Avenue Choir. I am 80, two thirds of my choir are older than I am. There are not very many of them now, but they still sing beautifully. Many of them are capable of doing solo work, and the 13 of them that I have now provide beautiful music. They are willing to tackle anything I give them to tackle. Sometimes it feels like the choir is the church. Most of the members have been longtime members of the choir and the church. We have three couples, maybe four, in the choir who they've been married over 50 years and have been in the choir for over 50 years. You don't see that, you don't hear that. But it's not that we're just singing the melody and we've learned this music. Like I said, it's a challenge. And that's what makes us unique. And the fact that we can do more contemporary and yet still do the classical. And that's why we all keep coming back and why we all keep singing. We all hold some office in the church, every one of us. Last night at our council meeting, it's like, well, the choir's here. <laughs> the biggest difference maybe of this church and other churches is the music program. Very few churches anymore have 
a very active choir or a very active music program. Black churches will sing gospel music and they will sing hymns. Very seldom do you find where they will go into the anthems, the classical music. I was raised in a black church where our choir director was part of the National Negro Opera Company. And so I was introduced to the formal side, of classical music. And this was a church that was close to home that did that. And like I said, I looked for that challenge. Most of them are older than me and uh, are very dedicated. Uh, they, their ministry is, is phenomenal. I can always uh, be reassured that if the sermon falls flat, the choir will not. This was designed by a, a fellow named Elmer Milligan. Uh, Mr. Milligan was a very prolific architect. He lived right here in Wilkinsburg. He considered this his masterpiece. Unfortunately, he died when he was only in his 50s, but he was 35 when he des designed this beautiful church. This is uh, yeah, one of the buildings that's an architectural masterpiece. Uh, very few are exactly like this one. For those of us who've gotten married in this room, it's, it's very inconvenient to not have a center aisle. But we don't. If you look at our pulpit, it is absolutely centered. Some churches have a divided chancel where the sermon pulpit is on one side. This building was preaching centered. The pulpit is exactly in the center because preaching the word was the main f uh, focus of this building. The stained glass windows are magnificent. The pipes for the pipe organ, although I just recently learned they're faux. <laughs> they're, they're not working, at least ones that, that are visible, um, but uh, the, uh, just the architecture of, of itself, the detail is just absolutely beautiful. There is a white cross at the top of the church. I don't really know the dimensions of it, but it's, it, you can't miss it. It's very, very tall. It used to rotate around showing that there was Christian influence all over Wilkinsburg and it would rotate. That was put in not immediately when the church was built. It was about 10 or 15 years later. It no longer rotates, but it's still beautiful and significant. And sometimes when you look at the church and the sun's hitting it just right, it just absolutely glows. It looks like it's lit up. It doesn't light up, but it sure looks like it. We try to be open for anything that comes in the community. Um, and when the, there were, the people died over on Franklin, they met here. The community met here to talk about it. We've had AA come. We've had um, all kinds of people, you know, that are here in the evening. We establish relationships, like um, New Testament Church is very small. Um, that is up on Penn Avenue. But our doors are open to them. They don't have a kitchen. So when they have a funeral, or a dinner or a luncheon, they use our kitchen. Those kinds of relationships are important for a church and for working as a community. I, I know our, our historical society has met here for at least 20 years, maybe longer, and it, we've always felt very welcomed. When I came for meetings and such, that I felt like I belonged here. You know, I have my own church, I, I'm an Episcopalian, but when you came in here, came through those doors, you never felt like you were just a visitor. You felt like you were part of the, the Methodist family here. The PLEA school, PLEA stands for the Parents League for Emotional Adjustment. I was here when the PLEA school decided to move into our building. It was a very small group. It is for kids, uh, mostly who are autistic. The school does amazing work with these children, and they are probably at the top of our list of community groups that we welcome and we cherish. So this is very much at the, uh, the foundation and the root of Methodism, is having education, being a part of ministry. A lot of white people think, you know, it's a white church, but it's not necessarily come. And a lot of black people think this is a white church. I once had someone say to me, you must know who you are to belong to that white church. 
And I looked at him and thought, what do you mean who I am? I said, I'm here because I believe this was a welcoming place. I was comfortable. All around us there are black people, but we get very few in the church. Um, they will come and ask for help, and we give what we can when we can. But Sunday morning, you know, the doors are open. The doors are open. But a lot of churches are having that problem too in the neighborhood. So um, this generation doesn't go to church as before. And so it's finding a way to reach them. And that's what I'm about, trying to find a way to reach them, to bring them in. The church is, uh, continues the process of uh, defining who they are as they, they find the congregation uh, decreasing at a, at a steady pace, uh, in addition with uh, a building this size and the, uh, the cost of upkeeping uh, South Avenue United Methodist Church uh, is, a, is a challenge. Um, and so far, they're, 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 they're keeping their heads above water and doing a, a good job of it. Um, I, I think the congregation knows that if things don't turn around, um, that th this will not always be the case for, for, the, for the congregation. I can't be hopeless. Um, I know that our congregation is shrinking. Eventually, we, as a congregation, probably will not be here. The building will, and the Pittsburgh Conference can decide what they would like to do with the building when we can no longer use, uh, be here in it. Here is where folks have brought their babies to be baptized. Uh, before that, this is where they came to, to get married. Uh, this is where parents and grandparents were buried from. Uh, this is where folks joined the church. Their whole spiritual journey is tied up in, in this church, and and that is extremely important to that to that spiritual journey. Um, you know, this is a sacred space. Uh, this is a safe place. Uh, this is home. The building itself, you think, well, it's it's just a building, but it's a a little more than that. Uh, I know over the years, because of the dwindling congregation and so on, with had plans, what are we going to do? Do we want to sell the building? Do we want to build something else? Do we want to meet somewhere else? And there's a lot of hesitancy uh, for those kinds of plans because you have such a connection with, with the brick and mortar and the windows and, and obviously the people, but the building is, a, is an important thing. You know it, it's home, it's been there forever. And so for someone like me that's also been here forever uh, in my life. It's, the building's an important thing. They certainly understand that the church is a building and uh, the folks in actuality are, are the church. The two go hand in hand. Yeah.